Hi, my name is Kevin McQuillan, and the following pre recorded conversations are my attempt to make sense of the human experience through the practice of yoga. I hope you enjoy. Okay. It is day three of a yoga teacher training. I understand that not all of you are, are in the yoga teacher training, but that's okay. That is okay. You're included, you're here, and it's fantastic that you are, that we're all together, anchored into this practice that we seem to like, maybe even love, we're passionate about, who knows? And this conversation is designed to shape the day, to shape the day. And the theme today is authenticity. Authenticity, what an interesting theme. I'm going to break that down with some distinctions. And the way I like to look at things is like, okay, there's authenticity. I'm going to talk about that, break it down. Well, what's the opposite of that? I always like to look at the opposite. And so that creates balance. That's how it seems to me anyways. <clears throat> and the opposite of authenticity, I use the word disingenuous. It could be lots of other words, but disingenuous is the one that came to me. And you could also break that down. It's like define what disingenuous means. Well, inauthenticity, maybe something like that. Fake, I don't know, pretense, these kinds of things. And as we've been discussing along the way, in the training anyways, is that what supports authenticity is vulnerability. Vulnerability is key to support authenticity. <laughs> A couple of experiences, emotions in particular that support being disingenuous is fear and shame. Fear and shame have a way of supporting being disingenuous. And they're very moving emotions and have a way of uh, dictating the ways in which we move in the world. And we're very intriguing. <laughs> I'm so fascinated about the human experience in so many different ways. I find it so incredibly unique and fascinating. And um, how pointed we are. Sometimes it feels like we're random, but we're not so damn random. That's how it seems to me. And in this particular program, we're mapping you. <laughs> That's what's happening. You're being mapped, whether you knew that or not. And it will be brilliant in various different ways and then also frightening in others to really have that clear vision of who you are and why you are who you are through this particular program. It's almost breathtaking at times. And so up on the board here is disingenuous and there's some um, points to it <clears throat> to help shape what I'm talking about. The first is, I'm not interested in you. However, I want something from you. I don't really care who you are, but I know you have something that I want. So I'll be interested just enough to get what I want from you. And what I want is some damn attention. And I want your attention. Your attention, I want it. And I want it now. <laughs> and that's how we can move in relationships. And what I'm after is some praise and accolades, damn it. Tell me that I'm a good person. And that I have some worth and some value. And that you'll keep me around. Because I have this value and worth and make your life better even though I don't care about you all that much. <laughs> what I care about is you telling me that I'm a good person. And that's a position, a posture that we can take in relationship. Dare to resist giving me my due praise and accolades and I'll punish you until you give it up. Best you give in so I can win. And we're going to talk about this in the program today. Oh, the unique way that you look to win. And it's fascinating. Best you give in. Re don't resist. I'll get what I want. And that's good. Because <laughs> I don't really care about you. You're here to serve me, and best you do that immediately. And you might say to yourself, wow, this is kind of a harsh 
conversation so early on a Monday morning. And I don't know if this is true. I don't know if I do that in my relationships. Well, the consideration is that you do. More often than you may think. And the outcome is we're distorted, unoriginal, and careless. It's a self-centered approach. I care about me and fulfilling my wants. And you're just here to make sure that occurs. And that's how control and manipulation and domination and all these things show up and manifest in relationships. And it's a weird way of looking at relationships in some ways. But it's a worthwhile look into your relationship. The ways in which you are careless. You're careless with yourself. That shows up in poor decisions you make. And the outcomes in which you produce in your life that create chaos and conflict. And if you're doing that within, you sure are doing that outside of you in other relationships. There's this interesting perspective when it comes to relationship. Either we're dominating or looking to avoid domination. <laughs> and it's a fascinating way to look at relationship. Either I'm dominating or avoiding domination. And that's the drive to win. What happens to those that win? They survive. If we win, we survive. And so this is attached to survival in a whole host of different ways. It's primal. And that's how we can activate and use this, this body, this being, to move in the world. The problem with that is it has a way of undermining our relationships and in some ways hollowing them out. And it's detrimental because we're using strategies to do such a thing. Two strategies we spoke about yesterday. It's people pleasing. People pleasing. People pleasing is a self-centered approach. I'm going to please you until, get, until I get what I want. And when I get what I want, then thank you. <laughs> I'll move on to the next person I need to please until I get what I want, which is some praise. And if I'm praised, that means somebody must like me and love me and hooray for me. The other strategy is perfectionism, to perfect something, to be perfect at something or various different things, which produces value. If I'm valuable and making your life easier, you'll keep me around and hooray, maybe I'll get some accolades. You're so good at these things. Thank you so much. Hooray, I'm winning. I'm getting what I want. Of course, this is very unconscious and how this plays out but still plays out. And this is the ways in which, some of the ways in which we can be disingenuous. We're not so straight how we move in the world and specifically within our relationships. The opposite of this, well, let me give you an example. <laughs> A personal example. <clears throat> when I was young, a little lad, The experience I had when it came to touch was that it was punishing. That's what it felt like to me. It was rough and punishing. That's how I associated with touch. And how did that come? Where did that come from? It came from my mother. And the ways in which she was taking care of me, but it, sometimes it felt like it was an obligation. And it is sometimes, obviously. But it felt rough. And I have these memories of... Um, being in the bathtub and having my hair washed and the ways in which she used her nails on my skull was like so cutting and felt so brutal. <laughs> and when I think of myself in that experience, 
how traumatizing that was for me in, very, in various different ways. And I'm not saying that's what my mother was attempting to do, was traumatize me. I could say there was a loss of presence or something, and not paying attention to what was happening in my experience, and wrapped up in her own experience, as we become sometimes. But those moments in time shape my relationship to nurturing, and in particular, my relationship to touch. And I've struggled with touch my entire life, specifically with women. And all those collections of moments in time when I was young, of feeling like I was being punished and tortured in some ways, how that shaped me as an individual in my life, and how much attention I've had on avoiding touch and avoiding being nurtured. It's like, no, oh, no, you don't deserve that, so you don't get that. That was my posture with myself, no. And it was this experience of nurturing hurts, being nurtured hurts, touch hurts, so don't do either of those. The problem with that practice is I was consistently hurting myself because I didn't have the capacity to take care of myself. And I was so out of touch, like literally out of touch. And I've carried that with me, the punishment. I deserve to be punished, I'm not safe. Kevin, you deserve to be punished and you're not safe. And how I've been able to punish myself over the years in so many different unique and original ways and how I've allowed others to do the same to me based on this experience and this presupposition that I deserve that. I don't deserve to be cared for, nurtured, loved in the way in which I need to be loved. Whew. Ah, and it has been a struggle, I can assure you, of pulling myself out of that experience. It's been a brutal fight. And that's true for each of us in our own way. We can brutalize ourselves in very unique ways, and we have to be brutal to get ourselves out of that. We are in a bloody fight, that is for sure. <laughs> And that's why being harmless and cute and cuddly and all these kinds of things, it's like, fine, that's all great, but it doesn't work in various different circumstances. To straighten yourself out, to get yourself to align to what you have been depriving yourself of. And it is a bloody fight. It's not simple, it's not easy. But it's certainly worth the endeavor. Because a life of deprivation is suffering. It's the pathway into dis-ease, the ways in which we deprive ourselves. And we are masters of that for sure. Mm. And this came to me last night, and it was, whew. <laughs> Thinking about this, this lesson and these distinctions, <laughs> of when Serena rubs my head like with a soft touch it is so nurturing because it's the opposite of what I remember of like you know like that experience and I often fall asleep quite quickly because I feel so safe and so nurtured and it's not something that has been in my life for all that long. And how important it is to position myself in relationship where that can occur, where that can occur, where I can be in touch, where somebody can support me being nurtured. Because I can do that myself now in various different ways, but it's not the same coming from somebody else with that care, with that love, with that tenderness. And so that came to me last night. It's like, wow, 
That's so fascinating. And how much I appreciate that experience and how it's giving me access to a different side of myself. Where I am worthy of being nurtured, being in touch, and to ensure that I continuously set myself up for that, which is very much about authenticity. And there's some interesting distinctions on this board. Assume what you say and what you think is not you. It's an interesting perspective, and we've been talking about that. Much of who you think you are and what you say is not actually you. It's opinions you picked up, belief structures, ideology, I don't know, passages from books, podcasts, I don't know. It's really interesting to look at yourself that way, if you can look at yourself that way, and I encourage you to do. Most of what you think and most of what you say are the opinions of others. So then the consideration is you're not that original. <laughs> and that's in part the trap that we're in. We're not so original, especially if we're not practicing vulnerability. Because when we're practicing vulnerability, it's an authentic expression. Why? Because it's attached to you and your experience. It's coming from something that you've lived. Not some passage from a book or, I don't know, something like that. It's you. And you've revealed yourself. And it's a brilliant thing when it does occur. And from humility, begin to determine which thoughts and things you say are actually you. And that can only come from humility, you attempting to get a sense of who you are. And so the consideration is you have no idea who you are. And you might want to resist that and, I don't know, push against it and dismiss it and all these kinds of things. It's fine. Do that. But I encourage you to take this on and see how original you are, actually. Because it's a feeling. It's a feeling. It's an embodied feeling when you're being original. The very place that vulnerability is generated from. It's down low. It's not up here. You're just regurgitating some information you've collected. That's not what this is about. It's about infusing your body. And that's this beautiful practice of yoga in various different ways. How to liven your body and to pull your experience out of you. Which is teaching. If that's the kind of teacher you want to be. You reach in and pull your life out of you and speak about it and use it as a way to relate to people and ideally frame out conversations. This is a shift into your value structure and the move into maturation to get yourself out of strategies that are not you in various different ways. It's the unoriginal you, the unoriginal you get outside of strategies and into your value structure which is very difficult because you have to understand what your value structure is. The things that in which you are looking for in your life that mean something to you, which is not a head game. It's how your being is moving you in the world. The sweet, tender being that you are is looking for something because it needs something. And the idea is to allow yourself to be satiated through your value structure. And that's what we're attempting to do here through this particular program, is get you closer to what actually matters to you. Which is good for you, and it sure is good for your relationships. And you could ask yourself why, because there's more of you available You're drawing from your wisdom, your experience, your lineage, which is this well of depth. And so much you can draw on the billions of experiences you've had that live in your body. The outcome is you become compelling and original and caring 
You actually care about yourself. You care about others. I'm not saying you don't, but in strategies, you don't. And so there's a difference here between the caring you and the care less you. And the more you understand the two sides of you, the better off you're going to be. And that's why information is important, but it's the embodied information that's so critical. So we talk about these concepts, but then it's like, where is it? Where does it live in your body? The careless you. <laughs> what does that feel like? How do you start to think and behave and feel and move in the world when you're being careless? Versus the caring you. What does that sound like, feel like, move like? Because they're different outcomes. So there's the disingenuous you and the authentic you. The authentic you is supported through vulnerability. The disingenuous you is supported by fear and shame. And these are the dots we're attempting to connect. What's so brilliant about choosing to be with yourself through practice? You already know what you need. And if you're willing to adopt the amount of courage and responsibility needed to sort yourself out, which in part is completing your past, you'll have a different kind of life, no matter where you are in life. And so this is the key element to the therapeutics in which we teach. You've got to go places you do not want to go. And a part of that is into your past to complete it. So there's more of you here present to make the sound, sound, relevant decisions you need to make as an adult and to shape the kind of future you want. And so that's what's in front of you through practice. And to take your practices on seriously. If you want to be a serious person where people take you seriously, it happens through practice. If you're just in practice sloughing off, what do you think you're practicing? Sloughing off. <laughs> you do that enough, that's who you become. You're just sloughed off. If you're fidgeting and distracting yourself and chasing fairy tales, what do you think you're practicing? You're practicing being distracted. You can't sit still. If you can't sit still, do you think people are going to take you seriously? No. You want to understand that, especially you as a teacher. If you want to, have, if you want to be a teacher where you actually have an impact, People have to take you seriously. Otherwise, they won't trust you. Or otherwise, you're just collecting a bunch of people around you that are like you, which is a terrible idea. That's the recipe to stay the same and resist that with everything you have. Resist staying the same. So there's a lot at stake. And you could say, well, what's at stake? It's your entire life. You could say that easily, and everything you hold near and dear, that's what's at stake when you hit the mat and practice. And if you hold yourself to that edge, that's where things change. And so either you're practicing being disingenuous or the opposite of that. Those are the choices, the authentic you. It's really quite simple, <laughs> yet quite complex in various different ways. So let this be the morning where you shape your relationship to authenticity. Define it. Make it yours. That's the updating we're after. And we'll see what occurs today. Seem reasonable to you? Very good. Let me ask you a question to make this real. For you, the individual. Where are you currently being disingenuous in your life? With whom? You could say, well, me, that's absolutely true. <laughs> Yourself, you could say that easily. But where are you currently being disingenuous? With whom? Who's got something to say about that? Yet another act of vulnerability. See how this works? <laughs> My stepfather. Your stepfather?
your stepfather. Thank you. Work. Say it again. Work. With your work. Yeah, thank you. Who else? Friends. With some friends. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Brother. Your brother. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's like these are the things we don't want to say out loud. It's like, ah, oh, no, don't say it. <laughs> but it's worth saying it. And for those that stay silent, you want, to just, well, you want to ask yourself, why are you staying silent when it comes to a conversation like this? I can say why I'm staying silent. Yeah? I had gathered a bunch of like-minded people. Okay. Not a group, a group. Okay, good. Yeah, we have a tendency of doing that. Gathering like-minded people around us. That think like this, uh, think like us, behave like us, those kinds of things. All fine in some ways. Not so great in others. So as you move into these practices, pay attention to what you're practicing. Move out where you're disingenuous. Get it out of you as quickly as you can. Create the space for something new. And the newness, the expansion, is your value structure. That's the ridding of, to include something more of. All right, everybody. A great pleasure to be with you. Thanks for participating. See you on the mat.